afternoon, everyone. Before I start, I'm just going to say that um, we're going to end before half past or by half past three at the latest to enable those people who are going to attend the Brian uh, Oakley Memorial meeting at the DCS to be able to get there. I don't think there are that many people that it's it's uh, able to we can organise formally, sort of going in groups by taxi. Just, so there are just a few people going. Um, but if if you obviously if you can find somebody else who's going and go with them, that's great. But I, I'm not sure that it's something that it's something that we're capable. I'm not capable of doing it anyway. <laughs> organise it formally. So that's that's what we're going to do. Um, it begins at uh, 4.15, I believe, at the BCS, so that would give people, awkward people, enough time to get there. So, I'm very pleased today to introduce John Hutchins, who's the author of several books and articles on linguistics, information retrieval, and in particular on machine translation, which is what he's going to talk to us about. Uh, his principal works include Machine Translation, Past, Present, Future, an introduction to machine translation, and his editor of Early Years in Machine Translation, Memoirs and Biographies of Pioneers, and he's written many other things, and he's been a speaker at many machine translation conferences. He was president of the European Association for Machine Translation and president of the International Association for Machine Translation. Um, he was editor of MT News International, He's been editor of the Compendium of Translation Software, and since 2004, he's compiled the Machine Translation Archive. He's going to talk for about an hour, and he's happy to be interrupted for any points of clarification or anything like that, but otherwise, uh, we will have, then have questions uh, to enable us to finish, especially from time. So, if I hand over to you, John, thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me I, in this august gathering here. I, all these people know far more about computers and their history than I do. Anyway, I shall talk a little bit about them. I've called it milestones because I'm not going to go and cover everything, as you can imagine. I've been going on for months and if, if you wanted to hear everything. So we'll start. Now, starting in fact 1933, before computers, because people were already by then thinking about mechanising translation. And there are two people in particular who submitted patents to do this. One, Arts Rooney, um, a Frenchman of um, Georgian extraction, <coughs> and Troyansky, a Russian. Uh, but all, but clearly what they were doing, dealing with was, was mechanical <coughs> dictionaries. So we can dismiss them really as an origin. The real origins come 1948 when a man called Richard, Richard Richens and um, Andrew Booth, who you know about, I'm sure, um, did a kind of uh, dictionary type translation. Is that the French input was first of all segmented into parts, segments being where the asterisks are, and then each uh, <coughs> sequence between the asterisks, or between the, between the uh, spaces, was translated. So it's word for word translation. You will see, first of all, that part is translated as either not or step. Uh, Etonne is astonish, etc., etc., and so on. Now, it was claimed at the time, amazingly, by Booth and, and by Richards, that people could actually understand translations like this. <laughs> I don't believe it. Right. 1949 is the really first step when Warren Weaver of the Rockefeller Foundation wrote a memorandum on machine translation. At the time he was collaborating with Paul Shannon on information theory and he also discussed his ideas with Andrew Booth. He visited the United States in 1947, no, 1946 and 1947. Uh, at that time Booth 
only suggestion was really a mechanised dictionary. Uh, but Weaver wanted to go much further than this. He himself was a translator and, and collected works on translation. And he suggested some fairly obvious things, disambiguation of particular words by examining the adjacent ones. Uh, the idea that a computer could be like a brain network. Um, and use of cryptographic methods. And he's famously said, when I look at an article in Russian, I say, this is really written in English, but it has been coded in some strange symbols. I will now proceed to decode. So this is his idea of how machine translation might work. And as we shall see towards the end of this talk, this basic idea is what is happening now. Anyway, he also believed that there was a universal language underlying all languages, which a lot of people thought at that time, a lot of people still think it. I don't, but it is, it is the belief of many people. The first conference took place in 1952, a year after Bar Hillel, our famous philosopher, uh, who was appointed by at MIT in May of the previous year. And he made a survey of everything that was going on at that time on machine translation, which of course was very little. But he convened the first conference at MIT, and they discovered, they discussed quite a wide range of issues, all of which, are, nearly all of which are still relevant. First of all, the question of whether a text should be pre-edited, prepared before translation, and then secondly, whether it should be post-edited, or revised at the end of translation. And if anybody knows about machine translation now, they know that both these things happen now. Controlled language, the idea of regulating English or Russian or German so that it'd be easier to translate. Uh, that particular suggestion, modern English, didn't come to anything, but anyway. The third one is restri restricting the domain of the, of the uh, text to be translated. And this is very commonly done now. Uh, is the idea of their micro glossaries, a, a dictionary specific for a particular type of text. Then there was syntactic analysis, and Bahilel had his own proposals in this, what he called categorical grammar, based on uh, logic. Then they also discussed computer hardware and programming. Uh, they didn't really know what was coming, but they suspected better machines would come. And they would discuss funding, how they were going to continue. By 1954, they, there was one group based at uh, Georgetown University and headed by Leon Dostoyer, uh, who was determined to show that MT was feasible, just to, as a way of promoting it, get it funded. <coughs> and there, therefore there was a collaboration between Georgetown University and IBM. IBM actually had the person involved mainly at IBM was uh, Claude Hurd, which <coughs> probably know the name, anyway. And in, in January 1954, there was a demonstration of a system translating from Russian into English. The linguistic parts of it were done by Paul Garvin, who's a well-known linguist, and um, it was programmed by Peter Sheridan at IBM. Now, it's very restricted because, as you can see on this slide, it had just 250 words and six rules. Not really rules of grammar, but rules. Uh, the result of this demonstration was reported very widely, particularly in the United States. Some of the reporters saying, machine translation is here now, or whatever. Uh, it in fact, arose, arose interest everywhere, including the um, Soviet Union. And it was the beginning of government funding in both the US and Soviet Union. Now here is a table of the part of the table <coughs> vocabulary um, and showing how it, this, in this particular case it 
translated Russian into magnitude of angle is determined by relation of length and uh, and of, of um, to radius. <coughs> I, I don't think I can really describe how this is. This was published in public uh, journal, uh, journals at the time. And I can't imagine anyone really understanding it. They must have thought it's a real uh, mystery. In fact, it's quite, si quite simple. Uh, the rule indicates that there has to be a choice between cold and angle. There's a Rus Russian Google, can be, be either. And that is determined by the code under CBD1 222, indicating that <coughs> follows magnitude and the three, the three uh, the, no, the two, sorry, the two, uh, no, there's a second code, two, 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 which relates back to call and angle. I'm not going to go any further than that because I've forgotten myself how it works. It's quite complicated. This is the machine on which it ran in that, that demonstration in January 1954, the 701. Huge machine, as you can see, um, with a very small vocabulary store. This particular machine, this experiment, was a um, great influence in the, in the Soviet Union. After the death of Stalin in 1953, the scientific field was opened up to ideas like cybernetics, structural linguistics, and computers. There were nothing before. Uh, so in 1954, there was news of the demonstration, and there was the first attempt at doing something similar with BSM. That's the main, at that time, the biggest Russian computer. Uh, and it found, and as a result, various groups were founded in the United States. Institute of Precision in Mechanics, State of Mathematical Institute in the English Naming College University. A BSM program, which is slightly easier to understand than the other one, is also very simple-minded. This is the procedures to go through in order to find the translation of a word like many. First of all, the, the word immediately preceding is checked, and if it's how, then the trans translation is skolko. If the preceding word is as, then it's stolco, and an undefined number. If it's much, it's not translated, it was treated as an adverb, and so on and so forth. And a step-by-step -step, um, elimination of possibilities. Uh, not at all the way people would do program now, let alone do linguistics. From this time onwards, I'm just, this is just um, an idea to keep in mind, there were, these are the main, major system types we have, both today and, and in the past. So at the very lowest level, or highest in this case, on the surface, is the direct or lexical translation. That's substituting one word for another, then reordering. Then there's the morphological approach, where we identified the functions of words according to their endings. Then the syntax, which I'll describe more, a bit more, mm -hmm. uh, where the structure of the sentences is determined in order to get the right meaning. And then there's the interlingua approach, very rarely pursued, but nevertheless there, where there's supposed to be one single representation which covers both the source language, SL, and the target language. The main groups in doing machine translation in the 1960s are these. Uh, University of Washington and the IBM working on a direct translation system under Reifler and Gilbert King. A Harvard uh, system under Ertinger, which consists primarily of a large dictionary. Massachusetts Institute of Technology under Ingve. Uh, Georgetown, where a large number of researchers were engaged, 
the Cambridge Language Research Unit in Britain under Masterman, this group who attempted to do an interlingual approach. Birkbeck College, here of course. The National Physical Laboratory in Teddington. Milan University, another interlingual system. Then the Russian ones, which I've mentioned already, Institute of Precision Mechanics, Leningrad University, uh, two, 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 two uh, in, in Leningrad, and the Institute of Linguists. Now, since you won't know much about these systems, I thought I'd better say something about the main groups then. First of all, the Georgetown University, a group founded in 1954, was the largest MT group in the United States with over 20 researchers, funded by the CIA for obvious reasons. They're doing Russian into English. They had a variety of methods which they examined, experimented with, a kind of code, code matching system, syntactic analysis, sentence by sentence, and a general analysis system which was supposed to integrate all of them. Uh, eventually that one, GMT, general analysis program, was adopted with multiple levels of analysis, that's to say morphological analysis, syntactic analysis, syntagmatic, that's a, a phrase structure, um, and syntactic analysis. And then is it, part of it was implemented on a system called Cerner by Peter Turner, who later on went to, on to invent Sistran, probably the best known machine translation system you will know about. Uh, the results of their research were demonstrated at Pentagon in 1961 and installed, so the systems were installed at uh, Eurasm and the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And they went, they continued to operate there for the next 10 years, if not longer. Just to give us an idea what, what I mean by syntactic analysis, I'm not, I'm not sure how much people do know these things. Uh, if you know that the man fell into the river, this could be segmented into the man as a noun phrase, fell as the verb, into the river as a prepositional phrase, and three combined into a tree, tree structure, as referred to in, in linguistics. Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, as I said, found started in 51 with the appointment of Bailer and the uh, first NT conference. From 1953 to 65, it was directed by Victor Ingo. This one, this particular group, insisted that they did fun fundamental linguistic research. They were not interested in shortcut methods, as they called it, the kind of word for word, word ad hoc approaches that others did. Um, in the group involved at MIT was uh, Chomsky. He was the best person I ever, best known person I ever employed. Not that he actually did anything on machine translation at all. In fact, a few years after this, he said that it's a complete waste of time. And lots of people have thought the same, <laughs> and still do maybe. Right, he was involved in a lot of linguistic analysis for the German to English system. It and the group developed Comet first non-numerical string processing language. This is before LISP. In fact, LISP was partly inspired by it. The other, the main, one of the main features was what they called syntactic transfer. Tran uh, the chain transfer from representations of syntactic structure in a source language into representations of the structure in the target language. They did do other languages, like Finnish and Arabic, but in that 1964, Inve said they have reached a semantic barrier. They can't go any further with the syntactic analysis. And that, I he was probably absolutely correct. Inve himself was editor of Mechanical Translation, a journal which started in 1953, and he was the co-founder of the Association of Computational Linguistics, which is the chief linguistic Computational Linguistics Society in the world. So he himself was quite an important person. 
This is syntactic transfer, uh, the model for MIT and, uh, and many later systems. So she likes to play tennis, see spiel tennis girl. The, whole, the point is that the like part of the English has to be translated into an adverb girl and you change the structure as well. That's what's meant by a syntactic transfer. Harvard University, founded in 54 by Anthony Erdinger, uh, developed a very large Russian English dictionary which produced word for word translations and was intended to be used by translators or by scientists, but I do not believe it ever was, but still it was a very large dictionary. And, but he did think of it as a research tool. Then 1959, they started syntactic analysis based on a, what is called a predictive analyzer developed by the National Bureau of Standards by Ida Rhodes. This, this is to say a, a program where, say, if you had an article and then a noun, you could predict that the next word could be a verb. And if you've got noun, verb, you could then predict that the next part of speech would be a definite article, or it could be an adverb. There's no <coughs> possibilities, but there are, they're all predictions. And if they're satisfied, then that is considered to be the correct analysis. And it rewinds back to the next stage. Uh, further developments at Harvard, most important is the, I think, the push, the push down store computer technique which is based rather like really on the predictive analysis that is to say if a particular word has been predicted then it's pushed down a, a stack and the next one which follows in the sentence goes on the top and there was also a multiple path predictive analyzer simply because multiple path because it was found that a single path didn't work more often than not it failed so they tried doing multiple paths and, and, and uh, choosing between the output. One of the people involved in that was Warren Plath, the name you'll recognize, he was the brother of Sylvia Plath, the poet. Birkbeck College. Now, some of you know about this already. We've got uh, Booth's original content collaboration with Richards on morphology. morphology. Uh, first research by Booth was done on a dictionary and the uh, first test of the procedures on uh, Apex, which he himself built at Birkbeck. The next task was a faster dictionary lookup and he proposed there the, what he called binary division. That's to say you, you look in a dictionary, uh, an alphabet, alphabetically arranged dictionary, first of all the very middle, and if the word you're looking for is less than that word and you went up the dictionary you know, halfway up and if it was more than then you come down halfway down so this the second half I don't know whether that method is still used or not I doubt it somehow it was found, founded in fund funded by the Mafia Foundation to do a French English system tested in 1958 and it did they did some research on German but it was not programmed because of the Limited uh, computer facilities at the time. In 1962, Booth uh, departed to the University of Sask Saskatchewan in Canada and put, participated in a trial for a possible Canadian machine translation system, which actually was won by a team from Montreal. I think he himself felt that there was a bit of This is the, his machine. I think in about that, 52. It looks to me very, very much like the Colossus <coughs> on a smaller scale. But anyway, so it doesn't seem as though things advanced much by then. 
Anyway, that's by the way, that's the one he worked on. Cambridge Language Research Unit, based of course in Cambridge, but not in fact part of the university. It was founded by Margaret Masterman, and uh, first of all, they, they tried out an interlingua approach uh, based on what Richards called naked ideas. So there are 51 of these, what they call semantic classifiers, like ask, bang, be, base, da, 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 da. and you, from these basic elements, you build dictionary entries, such as to distress, cause, sense, not please, cause someone to not be pleased, yeah? and to join, cause to be part of. And the idea was the whole of the vocabulary of English, presumably, will be analysed using just these 51 elements. They got quite a long way doing this, but they, they, in the end, they, I think, they ran out of time. It was just impossible. But this idea of breaking uh, words down into component uh, atomic elements was taken up much later by the artificial intelligence people, particularly Roger Shank. And they had acknowledged, some of them acknowledged the origins in Margaret Marston's work. The other thing they did there was the thesaurus. Uh, lexical items under particular headings, you, you know that with the Roger, Roger thesaurus, it's divided up into headings, uh, like, well, it would be like computers or uh, or uh, artificial or anyway, and under le lexical items under those headings, they occur, occur, lexical items occur under more than one heading. So, for example, plant comes under place, vegetable, agriculture, trick, and tool. And the idea was that if you had plant with another word, uh, like dig, dig plant, dig itself would have a relationship somehow to agriculture, and therefore you know the particular sense of plant in this case is the agricultural one. Some of their results of all this work appeared as a, a pigeon translation, as to say, I, th I, th I think I've got an example next. I have, yes. Here we are, pigeon translation. This is a translation from Latin. Oddly enough, the, the Cambridge Language Group insisted that quite a lot of their work was in Latin. I don't know what, who they were trying to prove, prove it was a good way, but anyway. They, <coughs> so, among, the, the plus signs mean that the, these two words are joined together in either a, a word, a stem and word, or word and stem, or in a construction. So you've got this, uh, this is the output, and I think it takes a good deal of effort by anybody to understand what on earth it means. But anyway, this was the kind of, of pigeon, we called it pigeon translation. Okay, I'll go on. National Physical Laboratory in Teddington. It's led by uh, John McDaniel. It began work on the ACE computer, which, as you know, was designed by Turing, or partly. They did scientific texts, Russian to English, and they used the Harvard University Dictionary, 18,000 words. But it was not, however, operational until 1963. For international words, what they call, you know, the words you, which you find in many different languages, in slightly different forms, they transliterated those. But they did have some syntactic, syntactic analysis, verb groups and so on and so forth, but they themselves said that the results were a little better than word-for-word -word translations. An evaluation in 1966, however, said they were slightly less than good. I would say, personally, slightly less than bad. <laughs> but in fact, the, the, the laboratory did organise a major international conference in 1961, which brought together everybody, I think, in the field throughout the world. It was quite an achievement. Now, going on a bit after, really, 
The next stage is what I call, and I think is an important publication by Bar Hillel, who surveyed critically most of the MT groups at that time, saying that their aims were unrealistic. Uh, well, by, um, they, because most people were in fact assuming that the goal of machine translation was fully automatic, high quality translation. And he demonstrated in this article that this goal was not feasible. It would require encyclopedic knowledge in the system. The, the, these were his two major examples. The pen was in the box and the box was in the pen. In order to, to identify which meaning of pen in each case, you have to know quite a lot about the meaning of pen and box. And of, obviously, of course, in as well. Anyway, now this particular example was, as I say here, convincing for many people at that time. And um, they thought, well, their aims cannot be for the automatic translation. There were, however, some people who, who said, we can deal with it. And one of them were, in fact, the Cambridge Language Research Unit. They thought that their thesaurus method would deal with these problems. And it might, I suppose, have done so if they developed it more. Uh, now, as I say, later artificial intelligence and statistical methods may mean the argument is no, not quite as compelling as it was at the time. So I think we're moving now towards some solution, in quotes, to this, this kind of problem. Now, I'm jumping forward to another four years because in the World's Fair in New York, there was a demonstration of a machine translation system. And this was based on the research at the University of Washington by Reifler, a dictionary-driven Russian-English system. And it, the, store, the dictionary itself was stored on what, is, what was called then a photoscopic disk. That is to say, it was rather like one of those large disks you get in, you got in mini computers flat things, not in metal though, but photos, uh, uh, glass disc with uh, mark, the marks, plus and minus, uh, one and two, one, one and zero, I mean, <laughs> on the disc. I haven't got a picture of it, I'm afraid, I should have, should have bought one. Anyway, the disc itself uh, idea didn't last beyond, beyond this demonstration. Um, in 1959, the system, which I'm referring to, was delivered to the United States Air Force and um, went on until 1965 when there was a second version which remained in operation until 1970. This is an example uh, printed by the developers of this system at the World's Fair conference saying that this, this was produced by their system. Now, actually it's quite good. In fact, I think it's quite good. And the reason is, of course, that they didn't allow anyone else to, to try out their own input. <laughs> you can only have this. Now, just, just to add of interest, I, I ran through the same thing on table fish just recently. And you'll see, if you read it very carefully, that in fact, it's worse than the World's Fair translation. It's not immediately obvious, but if you go, go through it, you can. And you'll see a number of cases where the Russian word has been retained, which is indicative of the, of the uh, uh, weaknesses of the dictionary. Now, that, that is, of course, done. That's the Babelfish system produced by Google. Possibly the best one there is. Possibly. I only say possibly because uh, don't really know. 1966 with, is definitely a watershed year for machine translation. And this year, the ALBAC report appeared. ALBAC stands for Automate, Automatic Language Processing Advisory Committee. It was set up by the US sponsors, mainly the military, uh, Navy and Army, and CIA, and uh, National Institute of Health, Various, various large, large government organisations. 
because they were getting worried about the slow progress. Uh, you know, they're thinking really of, well, back in 1954, you had what you called the machine translation system, and here we are in 66, and it's no better. Anyway, they concluded in their report there was no effective machine translation despite the massive funding and there was none in prospect. They were led to this conclusion by the poor quality of the output, but nevertheless, I think they were criticised at the time for their short-sightedness. In other words, people said, give us time. And of course, they weren't prepared to give time because it meant a lot of money. Anyway, it brought to an end, this report brought to an end funding in the United States for many years. And it affected funding elsewhere. It, it ended, more or less all the British research ended as well, exactly the same time. A lot of the Russian systems went completely. The nascent research in, uh, in the continent, the European continent, were also cut off. So it had a very profound effect on uh, progress. So anyway, here we are. What, what, what are the consequences? Well, which, 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 what were the lessons learned, rather, by, by the researchers? First is the identification of the user needs. Decide whether what you're producing is translation, which is to be disseminated, like a publication, or whether it's just a translation for people to look at and grasp the basic meaning of a text. As the consequence was that the perfectionism, which was the goal of uh, many of the early researchers, that this had neglected the operational factors and requirements, had neglected the expertise of translators, and suggested that what was really needed were machine aids rather than machine translation. And henceforth, from this date onwards to the present time, you can say there are three basic areas. Now, the translation tools and aids, like mechanised dictionaries, or translation memory, and so forth. And then there's the operational tools, post-editing, controlled languages, domain-specific systems. <coughs> and there's, that's the, the second one, the development of uh, these aids. And this third one is the usual research on new systems, new approaches, new methods. Whereas before, it was all concentrated on the research side. Oops, sorry. Go back again. Yeah. Between 1967, immediately after Alpac, until 1978, for a, de a decade in other words, the research was very much on a much lower stage, a much lower level. There was some research which continued in the United States, such as at uh, Texas and Wayne State, and in the Soviet Union, slightly in the UK, not very much, Canada and France. 1970, Sistran, which has been the longest and best uh, for a long time system, was installed at the USAF. 1970, Titus was installed. This is a restricted language system for the textile industry and abstracts rather than texts. 1975 is the Meteo system based on the sub-language of weather forecasting and this still continues now, although a slightly different program. Colt, a Chinese-English restricted language system on mathematics and the European Commission or European Union acquired a CISTRAN for its own purposes in 1976. <coughs> then, in 1978, also, we have CISTRAN being used with a controlled language, and that is the way in which CISTRAN is often used these days. I've just gone back now to these main division of systems again, just to remind you that you've got these various levels morphology, syntax, semantics, and interlingua because I'm going to mention them again. The first one, the direct translation method, which is the one which was adopted by in the earliest years, 
you can regard this as being a model where the input is first segmented into words, then, word, uh, then they're matched against target language words, and the target language words are extracted and then reordered to form a text. And these operations are under the control of dictionaries and grammars which combine source language and target language information. So the basic model is segment, extract, and combine, or reorder. There was a word, they were usually word for word, but there was some morphology and, and some reordering of the target language. Then we come to the, the next model, 1978, the transfer-based machine translation. Um, there are a number of systems I mentioned here which are all called transfer-based. Uh, the Ariana system at Grenoble, um, doing French, Russian into French, English into French, German into French. The Eurotra system, which I'll say more about shortly, funded by the European Commission. Logos um, in the United States for German into English. Where the, previously this system had experimented on English into Vietnamese for the, obviously, for the United States Army or Air Force. Uh, but they converted their system to German into English. And it was, in fact, installed in quite a lot of places. The MOVE system at Kyoto University from Japanese into English and English, and English into Japanese. METAL at the University of Texas, uh, German into English. Then in Russia we have Melchuk's model called Meaning Text Model. Uh, I won't go into that in detail. And then uh, the Etop model uh, for English into Russian mainly. The transfer-based model is, is roughly like this. Three stages, analysis, transfer and synthesis. The analysis phase uh, produces from a, the input text a tree representation, such as the one I showed around the syntactic analysis, analysis. <clears throat> and that is tr transferred, syntactic transfer, into a tree represent representation in the target language. And then from that is synthesized or generated the target language text. And it has these various uh, tools to achieve those ends. The main thing to, to note is that there's, there's a separate source language, language lexicon and, and grammars and a, so, and a separate target language lexicon and grammars, unlike the direct translation method where they, those, those are combined. So the next result is a multi-level representations at the, at, the, at the tree representation. That's, that's to say it combining morphology, syntax and semantics. And it has tree transduction or tree transfer, which is syntax oriented. In other words, not, not semantically or, or <coughs> oriented, but syntactically oriented, which is quite an important point, which we'll come to later. Ariane, founded in 1960, um, was initially an interlingua model, uh, but it had many failures, the interlingua. The trouble was the reduction to an interlingual representation meant that a lot, lot of useful information from the source language was lost. A lot of information about the, particularly about the uh, cohesion um, uh, connections between words and sentences was lost because you, you reduced everything to a single uh, interlingual representation. It was, they renamed the group uh, Geta, and they adopted a transfer model from 1971 onwards. In theory, it sounds as though they still, the Grenoble system still exists, so I can't give a closing date for that one. But there is a strict separation of the linguistic data and the programming, which seems an obvious thing to do but it wasn't obvious until 1970. <laughs> uh, and it had the various stages, which we've gone through already. Morph uh, in fact, I'll show it 
diagrammatically in it. And it's one of the most influential machine translation systems of that particular era, I should say, not, not ever. This is a diagram of the stages through which translation went in the, uh, in the Aryan system. So you're starting down here with the source text, a string of characters, morphological analysis, and a label tree is the output, a multi-level analysis, which means it's got syntax and semantics and so forth all together, an intermediate source structure, uh, which is transferred by a structural representation, structural transfer to an intermediate target structure, and then from that is generated. And these ATF, Sigma, Probra, and Transfer are the particular programs or subprograms which do various operations. So as you can see, it's quite a complicated system. And the result of the complication was that it didn't really work. Eurotra, <laughs> uh, designed in many respects rather like Ariane, funded by the European Commission from 79 to 1992, the intention was to replace Sistran because they thought that Sistran couldn't possibly be developed further and they'd have to start afresh with a a more sophisticated linguistic system. There were 80 or 100 maybe researchers in eight member states, these here, not, not usually uh, groups which were doing already machine translation, they were completely new. So the UK membership was University of Essex and the University of University of Manchester Institute of Technology, Science and Technology. Um, France was not uh, Grenoble, but Nantes, and so forth. We carry on. It's a, the design was a multilingual transfer system. In other words, from each language, you should be able to translate into any other language within the European Union communities. It requires precise specification of all the stages. Uh, and what they did propose was that the, in, the transfer was not, <coughs> was not an interlingua, but something like what they call Euroversals. In other words, words which would, uh, were apparently well known to everybody in every European language, if you can imagine. It was, from a linguistic point of view, it was an ex excellent project and it, and it uh, forwarded or promoted computational linguistics very well. But the system neglected the dictionary and the industrial prototype, which was the aim of the funders, this was definitely not provided, delivered. Previously, all MT systems were for mainframe computers or, or at best mini computers. So the, the first uh, companies which provided software for personal computers translation were Alps in the United States and Wideman, also in the United States, based actually in the, at mainly at Brigham Young University, all ones in other words. Um, quite why they were, and I've never, I've never found out quite why they were so, so enthusiastic, but I think I presume it's because they wanted to tr translate all their documentation into as many languages as possible. Anyway, uh, Alps and Widener both came from there. Gravis was a, a Japanese firm which acquired Widener right, in about 82, I think. Then the subsequent, we had a large number of other companies producing uh, translation software for personal computers and a very large number of Japanese ones. I haven't listed them all because there are too many. In 1982 or thereabouts we have the beginning of AI interest in machine translation. Not the, not, not the beginning of AI but the interest in translation and 
One of the stimulants for this was the fifth generation in Japan. They were trying to jump over the usual generations of computers and get um, a particularly marvelous system going. It influenced the United, the United States research simply because they thought Japan was going to beat them. So research on interlingua systems, not AI, but interlingua systems, was promoted from about mid-1980s to the end at Philips with a system called Rosetta, which tried to implement Montague grammar. This is one of those extremely complex grammatical theories which some of you may have heard of. Uh, and the and Utrecht, the DLT system, distributed language translation, used a modified Esperanto and a bilingual knowledge bank. And then knowledge-based systems, which are obviously connected very closely with AI, uh, was pursued mainly in the United States at Colgate University, Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon, and then New Mexico State University, but also, as I didn't mention here, at the University of Southern California. This is the rough outline of what, what an interlingua system is, or is supposed to be. So at the center is this intermediary representation, the interlingua. As before, as in the transfer approach, there are two, two stages, analysis and synthesis, from the source language into the intermediary language and from that into the target language. And the separation, as before, between source language and target language dictionaries and grammars. But underneath here is uh, knowledge bases, which are meant to uh, inform or uh, aid the transfer into the intermediary representation. Now, in, in general, it's, it refines the output of the source language text before it gets into the intermediary language. As you may have gathered, or I don't know whether you have, but in this period there was a great deal of experimentation on a wide, a very wide range of linguistic theories, because these are all linguistic rule-based systems. Uh, categorical grammar. I, I won't go through them all, but you'll see, you'll see that uh, there are quite a lot of them. Uh, but I think one can say at the end that either the systems became too wieldy, too too cumbersome with these systems, or they just didn't work. Um, however, it was, you might say, good fundamental research for linguistics. Speech translation, one of the aims, of course, or one of the goals that people always ask about is when are we going to get speech translation? It really only started um, in research terms in about 1986 with ATR in Japan, which is automatic telephony research, Janus at uh, Carnegie Mellon, and Verbmobil in Germany, various German universities. What does it involve? Well, it involves obviously speech recognition, speech synthesis, two operations which themselves are quite complex. They're highly, they, all these systems are highly context dependent using knowledge bases. They try to do with discourse semantics. Uh, they have trouble with ill-formed sentences or utterances. There's a lot of ellipsis, a lot of stress, a lot of various intonation, and there's mortality markers. So these are all difficulties of a speech translation. Then last but not least is colloquial usage. It's not yet been investigated sufficiently for speech translation or even for in linguistics. So, given the difficulties of doing speech translation, all these uh, groups and subsequent ones restrict their at attention to very uh, limited fields. And a very popular one is 
telephone booking of hotels and conferences. I suppose the idea, or I know the idea, is they think that if it could work for these things, then they might get more money for other things. <laughs> As I say, speech translation is still continuing. It's been going now for, what, 30 years? No, 20 years. Um, and it's still in the early stages. But the main change, though, in the last few years, in the last decades, has been the emergence of corpus-based MT. In other words, abandonment of linguistic rules and taking the data for translation from corpora, bilingual corpora, which became really only available on large, to a larger amount in the 1990s. There was a begin in Japan. There was a, a proposed for an example-based machine translation research in 1981 by Makoto Nagao. The idea of this is I'll, I'll go back to it in a minute. But the idea of this is you take fragments of sentences, parts of sentences, and meld, translate them, and then meld them all together. The moment which has had most influence is statistical machine translation, which was first reported in 1988 by research at IBM. And, as I say here, revival of what Warren Weaver's idea of decoding the source language as a target language. I'll come back to it in a second. So this is the, the basic model of example-based machine translation. It's based on the observation that translators try to find similar phrases and sentences and their equivalents in a target language in previously translated texts. And the crucial one is previously translated texts. They're looking for actual examples. So they seek sets of analogies and examples from bilingual corpora. In essence, this is, we can say, this is a continuation of the transfer model but using statistical methods. So we have segmentation of the source language into a phrase or a pattern, match these in a, an aligned corpus with similar or related items in the target language and combine them using rules or what is called a language model, a monolingual language model in the target language. The statistics-based MT model is a little bit more complicated, but as I say, at the top, target language words and phrases are chosen as those most likely to correspond with the source language words in specific contexts based on probabilities and frequencies. So they combined, the, whatever is extracted, are combined in the ways most appropriate for the talk target language in a particular domain. In other words, the target language itself is, is analysed in terms of frequencies and sequence, sequences of words in the target language. So you get, in a way, you get from the source language a kind of bundle of words corresponding roughly to the order in which they appear in, in the source language. And these are rearranged in the, by the language model in the output. So here we are. And as I say here, yes, in a way you can regard this as a kind of revival or inspiration by, of the direct translation. So segmentation, extraction, combination. And in other words, back to Weaver's cryptographic and information theory ideas. This is not the way, by the way, that um, researchers in statistical machine translation envisage their system. This is my, my interpretation. But the basic processes are what they do. The other great event uh, inspired by the large number of bilingual corpora which were appearing 
at this uh, in the early 90s, 1990s was what is called the translation memory, a tool for translators to use. Previously, uh, translators had, di had dictionaries, term banks, concordances, and so forth. <coughs> 1993 was the <coughs> launch of the first commercial uh, translation memory system by Trados. <coughs> uh, using aligned bilingual corpora, that's the same sentences in two languages which are matched with each other so that the tra translator can see if he looks up a particular source language, word or phrase, he can see what possibilities there are in the target language. And the attractiveness for translators of this system is that they have, uh, they have control of what, what's happening, unlike a machine translation system. They can manage their terminology in the same system. They have facilities for making their own dictionaries and include informa other information from the internet. And translation memories are compatible with authoring and publishing systems, which is another great advantage for the translator. I'm now going back to statistical machine translation because it hasn't stood still with the model I showed. Uh, what, it, what they consist of is bilingual alignment of, of corpora and monolingual corpora, which are to be used as the language model. The word alignment, word alignment is, you see here in this example, from German to English, ich gehe ja nicht zum Haus, and I do not go to the house. You'll see that in this alignment, ich and I, ich and I are aligned, gehe is aligned with go, ja is not aligned with anything, nicht is aligned with not, zum, to the and house, house. Do in English is inserted, it's not in the original. So that gives you an idea of what a word alignment involves, of what work has to be done once you've got that alignment. There's quite a lot of war involved. So the first phase they went after the word alignment was phrase based alignment. So taking particular blocks of words two or three words, and having these aligned with each other, I get a slightly better results. Next stage, or one or more simultaneous, is adding features or tags or whatever you like to call them onto the corpora, the source language corpora, which would enable the reordering to be more successful. In other words, if you can identify the what is the the, the nouns, verbs, adjectives, and so forth, and these tags are retained in the source, in the target language, then you could re re use those tags to reorder the output. Next stage is finding that there were not enough bilingual corpora for all the languages they wanted. In fact, in fact it's true to say that it's very few languages in the world have very large bilingual corpora. These are English, French, German, Russian, Spanish, Italian to a much lesser extent. But if you want, if you go into other languages like Czech or Greek or uh, even Chinese, there are not many bilingual corpora which can be aligned. So people are now looking for what are called comparable corpora. In other words, corpora which are on the same topic but not necessarily aligned with English or French corpora. Then we have what they call syntax aware uh, statistical machine translation, which involves use of syntactic information in the ge generation of the target language. So pre ordering or tree strings, and so on. And then lastly, uh, probably the most what well, is the most recent development is crowdsourcing, using uh, translators or people who know languages on the internet to help out with translation. This is particularly useful for evaluation, perhaps not for actually producing translations. 
But anyway, we shall see how that goes. It is a development, a very recent development, the last five years. recent years is the automatic evaluation of machine translation. Up to, up to about the 1970s or 80s, or no, no, up to the 1990s, uh, it was all done by human judges, judges of systems. Um, and the one that I've just put down, Femti, as being the best known of the system. But in the 1992 and so on, DARPA, again, US government <coughs> authority, getting worried about the poor quality of translation, insisted that uh, they were going to evaluate um, the U United States systems in their unedited form, not, not after post-editing, but raw, the raw output, and compare them with uh, human judgments. So the result of this has been a number of developments in automatic evaluation systems, the best known which is of which is blur. I think it's pronounced that way. Uh, statistical measures of the similarity of the source language, of the statistical machine translation output, and human translations. The human translation they refer to as reference texts. So, how close does machine translation come to what a human would produce? 1997 free online machine translation is now what most people think of is machine translation. At least it's the one with the greatest exposure. It started, you may be interested to know, back in 1988 with the Minitel system, but it was charged. The CompuServe also came first in 1992, again charged people to use it. And then Sistran offered online translations in 1996 not very enthusiastically. The Babelfish, which is the origin of most systems now, um, first came out on 1997 and has had, as you see down here, a really massive growth. I haven't brought it right up to date. In fact, I don't know that the figures exist. So, what do we have? 19 2006, some of, the, some of the current projects just out of interest. Euromatrix, basically a project to produce uh, statistical systems for all for translation between all the European Union languages, over 500 language pairs. Very ambitious, but they argue that because statistical machine translation systems can be developed very quickly, they can do it. It's cer certainly they can be developed much more quickly than real rule-based systems. It, use, it uses a lot of open source materials and there's a second si system I've got mentioned here, Let's MT, founded three years ago, two years ago, which is an online platform for data sharing and building systems. We don't have to forget that throughout all this period, people were, companies were actually using machine translation, usually either with pre-edited input or controlled language, or putting in without any controls, and at the end, post-editing or using their dictionaries or respecting the system to a particular domain. And this, in fact, is by far the largest use of machine translation is with human aids, human, aid, human assistance. Except, I do have to add, the online machine translation, probably in terms of numbers, is much larger. <coughs> but it's, it has been found that um, most people using the online systems, such as Google and so on, uh, only put in short phrases or individual words. They don't put sentences in, and certainly don't put texts in. So the peculiar misuse, you know, I call it, of a translation system. Why don't they use dictionaries, I'd say. 
Mm. Okay, so as a conclusion, uh, human translation and machine translation, how do they uh, stand against each other? I would, I would, these are my assertions now. Human translation is okay for literature and other culturally sensitive translation. In fact, I can't see any prospect of machine translation doing that. Machine translation, by contrast, is for technical scientific. It's for texts which are culturally neutral. That is quite an important point because you do get scientific texts which are not culturally neutral. Uh, human translation with translation aids and human aided trans translation for publisher quality translation, which is the kind of thing which organizations use the machine translation for, as on the previous diagram. Machine translation for assimilation, just finding out what the content is, the gist. And then, as I say here, yeah, MT for real-time online translation may be, this may be, the, the real niche product for machine translation. And as a general observation, the less the user knows of the source language, the more useful to him becomes fully automatic translation. In other words, they don't know what they're getting. They don't, they don't in many cases, they don't know how bad it is. <laughs> because we have plenty of evidence that people do use these systems to translate into languages they don't know, and they pass them on as a translation. And finally, human translation for spoken translation. I cannot see myself that MT will ever cover that area. And then MT will be integrated with other translation tasks. I think that's, well, I've got a kind of summary which you probably can guess a lot of what I was saying anyway. This, this, is, what we, this is what we have, and uh, we've got, you'll see we've got mainly, that's an important point, hybrid systems which combine statistical and rule-based systems, automatic evaluation, um, the dominant framework is statistical, speech translation is there and still coming. Uh, special purpose MT is an important and growing area, and I think it will continue to grow. Less resource language is an important problem, but that is being tackled. And then we've got edits. Finally, I just put up here a list of resources. First of all, machine translation archive, which has got a large number of articles on it, uh, which you might like to look at. There's my own website for the history of machine translation. I'm, I'm about the only one that does anything on the history. Uh, readings in machine translation for a good selection uh, of articles on machine translation going back to the beginnings and up to the up to, uh, uh, 20s. And as an introduction of machine, statistical machine translation, there's an excellent book by Philip Kerr. And the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, John. That was uh, a very interesting subject that I knew nothing really about before. So thank you very much for covering the history of machine translation. I think we've got time for one or two questions, have we? Ah, well, that's the important thing. Yes. Oh, so we do it next time with the films. Because we're going to show the whole film. Oh, right, okay. That's we'll do that. So we'll, we'll postpone that. And so we do have time for one or two questions if anybody has any. So I close this down or what? Okay. I think we should have filmed it. Thank you. I, I suppose it's much easier to translate or attempt to translate between two, a pair of languages that are in the Indo-European category um, than between one that is and one isn't. For example, to go from Finnish to French, mm -hmm. is, that, is that in reality much more difficult than going from, say, French to German, because they're different uh, kinds of languages, or isn't that the case? Well, 
where the Romance, uh, translation between the Romance languages, uh, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, Romanian, is much easier than German to English. German is one of the difficult ones, probably more difficult than Finnish even, because Finnish has all these uh, morphological endings which can be extracted and so you can build up the target language using that information. But uh, obviously Chinese and Japanese, Korean are all difficult ones to translate into English. But Korean and Japanese are quite close. So that, that, that's, in fact, they, that's quite a successful one. Uh, yes, it's obviously true. There are some languages which are easier than others. Well, it's a Finnish to English is fairly easy. Not Hungarian, well, Hungarian to English also. Is that the case? Or yes, it would be. It would be, but not when you say fairly easy. I'd say not as difficult as. <laughs> Andrew. Okay. Andrew Herbert, I was with Microsoft Research for the last ten years, and a number of observations that um, actually reinforce some of the things you said. When I joined in the year 2000, they were just looking at all their computational linguists go to replace some of the machine learning folks for statistical machine translation. Um, the project that worked most successfully for Microsoft was the online web pages of user advice and support, for which about 20% have been hand translated into all the countries where yeah. Microsoft does business. And so that gave us quite a large corpus. And then statistical machine translation was used off those hand translated parts to mechanically translate the rest. Um, and the user feedback was exactly as you said. Users who were, for example, Spanish but also spoke English would rather read the correct English pages than the partially translated Spanish <laughs> ones um, because they knew they were reading the ground truth. Yes. But if they had no English, then the Spanish translation was better than the English they couldn't uh, understand. Yes. Yes. And so for things like technical documents and so forth, um, it was felt to be good enough for the pages that people yeah. generally don't go to, the pages that get read a lot, um, and yes. those are always um, hand translated. So it's actually mirrors what you said, really. Machine yes. translation is very helpful for bold stuff that no one reads very much, but you have to yeah. use it because it. Which you can skim through and Absolutely. pick out what you want. Yes. Um, well, we certainly found statistical techniques were very robust and, um, and yes. really quite reliable compared yes. to all the content linguistic approaches that just seemed to fall in the first level. Yes, originally Microsoft did experiments on rule-based system, but then they abandoned that in favour of statistical. Yeah, yes. Um, I wonder if you heard in the last couple of weeks there was a news item that I think it was a Japanese telephone company was offering real-time voice translation, which I thought was pretty odd. Really? I real Babelfish. Using Babelfish? Well, no, a real Babelfish. Well, a real Babelfish. <laughs> Well, I know that they, back in the back in the 1980s, they did have uh, te a telephone translation system between Japan and, and, the, and I think the UK. Yes, um, but this was this was just to demonstrate that uh, they could do it in theory. I think, <laughs> um, but I've not heard of this this new one. No. Yes. Uh, machine translation towards the study of linguistics at all in that direction. No, no, it doesn't. Well, I think the statistical people are beginning to realise mm. that they need some in lingu linguistic information. I indicated some of it with the syn syntax aware uh, approach that they have. In other words, they'll use some syntactic structures to augment the statistical information. So they started off by saying we won't use any linguistic data at all. And many of them still don't. But uh, I think they're beginning to realize that they might get improved results if they use some, some linguistic information. Uh, just as a matter of curiosity, I think you mentioned Latin. Uh, has uh, any, any other the classic languages, sort of like ancient Greek, been uh, attempted? With a degree of success. Uh, well, success, I don't know. Um, uh, the one I showed was was way back in the 1960s, and the, and that was that was just a, a demonstration by the Cambridge Language Research Unit. But there have been commercially available Latin in 
Latin English systems or system, I know of one, called Blitz Latin. <coughs> I can't remember who produces it now, but uh, apparently they sell quite a lot of copies. But whether they ever, anybody ever uses them. Uh, mm -hmm. um, John, um, going back to the Latin one, um, I was trying, I was, I'm interested in the Cambridge Language Research Unit. I hadn't realised until you said it that it wasn't part of the university. No had tried the university uh, archives and not found anything. And um, the reason I was looking for it was it had, an, uh, it had an ICT 1200, which was a descendant of Booth's machine, but it had some mysterious additional hardware um, attached to it. And it was implied that, in fact, it possibly was related to, to uh, a well-known uh, organization at Cheltenham. Uh, and, that, 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 and I was struck also, of course, that you're your mention of them came not very long after the uh, your references to Russian translation, particularly from Russian into English and so on. Um, do you know, could you say a word or do you know anything about how, since it wasn't part of the university, it was funded, <coughs> what it was doing? Could it have been at least partially funded by the government? No, it relied, relied, relied on grants and so forth from, uh, many, in many cases, American bodies. Um, as far as I know. <coughs> I, could I, don't fill, know. I could fill the gap there. Um, two of its um, better known members were Roger Needham and Karen Spark Jones, yes. who both were both yes. scientists. Um, and they, they met as um, machine translation people. They were both funded by the Rand Corporation. And in fact, yes. it was quite a number <coughs> of people from Rand and Cambridge going back That's right, it was. In the early 50s. Martin Kay was yes. involved as well. Yes. Now, I was going to say that. The archives of the Cambridge Language Research Unit are now back in Cambridge in Lucy Cavendish College. But this is only, of course, the paper stuff. I don't think there's any equipment of any kind. Yeah. Thank you Delay coming over earlier on. So. Yeah. yeah. yeah.